That piece of music was written by this boy. His name is Elham. He was born in a country where music had been illegal, and he composed this piece while living in a war zone. This piece has now been heard by thousands of people in hundreds of places around the world, and it didn't happen through social media or mass broadcasting or large concert venues. To share with you how it happened, I have to go back to an earlier point in my career. This is Carnegie Hall, the mecca of classical music. I was trained as a classical pianist through my undergraduate in Rice University and my graduate degree at the Juilliard School here in New York. The conventional wisdom and thinking in those days involved building a career through participating in the many international, national, and local piano competitions. The hope was that a prize at one of these competitions would help launch a performing career that would include playing in a circuit of large concert venues or being engaged as a soloist with orchestra. Although I had some success with piano competitions in my early 20s, by my mid-20s, this was not the case, and I knew the conventional path wasn't going to work for me. So I had to find some new inspiration. Sometimes that can be found in history. I learned that most classical music that was written for piano and small ensembles, chamber music, was actually intended to be performed in small, intimate, private venues for a group of people that were part of the same social group friends, family, colleagues, etc. These kinds of concerts are sometimes called salon concerts. So when I played my first concert in a venue like this, a private home, the feeling of fulfillment was overwhelming to me. I could speak with the audience in between each musical selection and also after the concert one-on-one, -on -one, share insights about the music, share ideas. These conversations formed a social connection and were very inspiring to both parties. The audience was close to me and close to the music. After the concert, I realized that there could be a huge possibility with this. We classical musicians have been told for years that the audience for classical music is getting older, the opportunities to perform are shrinking, and at the same time, there's a growing number of very gifted artists. Putting all these factors together makes classical music world an intensely competitive place. However, maybe we could solve this supply and demand issue by thinking smaller and sort of broader at the same time. If each home could be a potential concert venue, there might not be enough musicians to go around. Working in this manner, one engages in the creative process of inspiring homeowners to become concert hosts instead of competing for a dwindling number of, of resources with other artists. So I decided to start a project called the 88 Concert Tour. I was to play one concert for each of the 88 keys on the piano, each one in a private home, in North America. At each concert, there might be 20 to 40 people. I would have, hopefully, form a special connection with each one, and this, in turn, would lead to other opportunities for playing in private homes and other opportunities for sharing and teaching music. Let me share where this idea has taken me. Guess where this is? This is a picture of Kabul, Afghanistan. Let's go back to Elham for a moment. Music had been illegal under the Taliban up until 2002, when the Taliban were removed leaving a cultural void in the country. In 2008, a man named Dr. Ahmed Sarmast founded the Afghan National Institute of Music. This school was to teach about 150 students from Kabul and other areas of Afghanistan in Western classical music, Afghan music, and Indian classical music. Because of a performance I gave in 2007 in Tunisia with some friends, I was invited to perform and teach at the Afghanistan National Institute of Music in 2009. One of the students I worked with was Elham. He asked me in one of our first days if he could have a composition lesson. He was interested in composing. So I gave him a few thoughts about how he could get started and gave him some homework. And I figured that during the first week, perhaps after a week, he could have completed a short first composition. However, he came back the next day with a completed composition that you've just heard a few minutes ago. I was so inspired and impressed that I told Elham, I'm going to take your piece all around the world. And I've done so. I've played it in over 20 countries for at least 20,000 people, mostly in these small concert venues I was describing earlier. When I played the concert in Dubai, a woman came up to me after the concert and said, I'd really like to help Elham. What can I do? I told her. So she purchased a piano for him and sent it to his home in Kabul. Uh, so here he is with his parents and his piano a few years ago at his home in Kabul, Afghanistan. 
This piano, coupled with Elham's determination, brings us to this moment right now. Elham actually received a very good scholarship to Hunter College here in New York, and he moved to New York just six weeks ago. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, and now he's connected to you because he's sitting right here. Please come up, Elham. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully he'll be here next, next year. So you've just experienced some of the magic that can happen through the personal connections formed in a salon concert experience. And this experience has opened some doors for Elham, and his story in turn has opened doors for others. After my experience in Afghanistan, I decided that my 88 concert tour had to go way beyond North America, so I decided to make it a global project instead. And there was one very special place I wanted to play. It was far away and it, quite expensive to get there, and I knew that I would need some kind of help from an airline sponsor. After weeks of being on the phone with the logistics manager of this airline and being told countless times, we'll get back to you on Friday, and not receiving a call on any of those Fridays, I decided to fly down there myself uh, part of the way, anyway, and uh, I approached the secretary of the president of the airline. I shared with her Elham's story and what my intentions were to give this special concert, and she immediately got me in to see the president of the airline. After speaking to him for just 30 seconds or one minute, he agreed to sponsor my trip to Antarctica. And there, we had a salon concert experience for some of the scientists that work at the research stations there. A man named Alejo Contreras was our guest of honor. Alejo Contreras is the first Chilean and the 27th person in history to make it to the South Pole on foot. We had a piece composed for him and honor him by premiering this piece in Antarctica. I also performed pieces of music from Russia, China, Chile, and Uruguay. These are the countries that have research stations in the same clustered together area on King George Island at the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula and the audience came from these research stations. Thank you to Elham for making this experience possible in Antarctica. And here's a picture taken after the concert with this Russian Orthodox church on the little hill there and a few penguins here to the left. Um, we did not invite the penguins to the concert. Now these kinds of personal connections uh, in the salon concert can take many, many forms. And it's time for me now to introduce you to Kain, Kain Huang from Taiwan. Now, don't let this sweet face fool you. When she puts her mind to something, incredible things happen. And through her passion for classical music and for the arts, she inspired support so that we could have a regional 88 concert tour in Taiwan called Taiwan 88. And we've played for over 20,000 school children in elementary schools in rural areas in Taiwan. One of the 70 schools we've been to looks like this. We had a few challenges with this project but one of them was that we weren't playing for 30 people in a living room anymore. We were playing for sometimes hundreds of students in a school or a gymnasium, like this picture. In Taiwan, school children are generally trained to be quite stiff and just listen to what their teacher says, and we wanted to create a more informal, interactive atmosphere. So this is how we did it. Um, I actually need a volunteer, hopefully somebody who has a name that is three to five letters long. Three, four, five letters, anyone have that? Yes? Amy, perfect. Okay, so, Amy, we are going to spell your name in musical notes. Many of you might be familiar with the music alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. We can also continue that alphabet. H would be A, I is B, J is C, etc. So for Amy, we would have A, M turns out to be this, and the Y turns out to be this. So Amy spelled in musical notes sounds like this. So I'm just going to improvise a very short 30-second piece based on your name. So, <laughs> thank you. After this moment, the kids went from very stiff to very engaged and excited. 
and uh, this is the power of a personal connection. So leaving behind for a moment the enthusiasm of Taiwanese school children, I'd like to talk about something a little bit more serious. This is a picture of Myanmar. Myanmar is a country that has been isolated for a long time until just two years ago. Uh, it often invokes thoughts of dictatorship and human rights issues. Well, Kayan and I had the opportunity to go there and perform in a salon concert for the U.S. ambassador at the U.S. ambassador's residence. Kayan then returned back to Taiwan and was being interviewed on Taiwan TV, and she shared her story about being in Myanmar with the very famous host of the show. Well, he became very excited and immediately introduced Kayan to some people who can really make amazing things happen in Taiwan. And now <laughs> we have an international music festival in Myanmar that's been going for two years. This festival somehow had this magical magnetic effect. Uh, it attracted support from the Taiwanese Foundation, from corporations both locally and internationally in Myanmar and internationally, um, embassies and other foundations, and even the Ministry of Culture from Myanmar and the United Nations. We had gone from living rooms and now we were on the international stage of cultural exchange, all through the connections formed in private salon concerts. We worked with many students throughout Myanmar, including this boy, Kevin. Kevin actually also moved to the United States this year to attend on a full scholarship um, a college in Missouri, and he's majoring in piano as well, one of the first pianists to come out of Myanmar. On a more personal note, at that concert with the U.S. ambassador, we were talking on the subject of names, and I shared with him that my name, Kimball, comes from Rudyard Kipling's book, Kim. The main character's name is Kimball O'Hara, and his moniker in the book is Little Friend of All the World. Well, now, the ambassador then told me, actually, Aung San Suu Kyi's son, Kim, is also named after this fictional character. So I sort of got goosebumps at that moment, and I knew we would be doing a salon concert with her someday. Well, here we are after the salon concert. You can see her and I in the back row there talking. And we've now had two concerts with her in Myanmar in this same salon concert format. I've met thousands of people, and I've rarely seen anyone with her poise and elegance, not to mention an intellectual titan that she is. So back to Carnegie Hall. After playing in over 30 countries, all seven continents, and over 300 concerts, I finally was able to play at Carnegie Hall's Zankel Hall this past April. Later, people said the concert was very personal, kind of like being in a living room. I was thrilled to hear that. Now, this story is not just about classical music. Small groups can work for any kind of music, arts, crafts, poetry, sharing ideas, development. We can inspire people, we can build friendships, we can foster a common humanity and heartfelt cooperation. If we think small and personal, extraordinary things can happen. Thank you. Thank you.